Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to turn in a moment to the usual statistical update about COVID. Uh, but before I do that, I want to say a special word to all young people across the country who are receiving their SQA results today. It's a, a long time, um, a very long time since I got my results, but I still remember it like it was yesterday. It is a really big moment in a young person's life. So I hope you got what you were hoping for. But if you didn't, it's really important to remember that there are lots of options open to you, not least in the immediate sense, the option to appeal. And whatever your results are, you should all be incredibly proud of the way you've coped with the challenges of the past few months. At a moment's notice, you had to adapt to new forms of learning. Your contact with friends and family uh, was restricted. Many of you missed out on a proper end to your final year. You didn't get to sit exams. And of course, you're now having to think about your future at a time of real economic uncertainty. All of that has been really tough and we don't underestimate just how tough it has been. Uh, and I know that for some of you, there will be difficult decisions uh, that lie ahead. Later on in my remarks, I'm going to say a bit more about where you can get some advice and support if you need it. And the Deputy First Minister will also say a bit more about the process uh, of producing your results uh, this year. But the main thing I wanted to say at the outset is that you all deserve enormous credit for your patience, for the sacrifices you've made and for all the hard work you've put in. So well done to all of you. Now, as usual, I'll give the update on today's COVID figures. Um, an additional 23 positive cases were confirmed yesterday, which represents 0.9% of people who were newly tested yesterday. And it takes the total number of cases in Scotland now to 18,717. Now, a full health board breakdown of these cases will be available later as usual. But the provisional information I have is that 15 of the 23 cases are in the Grampian Health Board area. It's not yet clear, uh, though, how many are connected to the ongoing outbreak in Aberdeen, and I'll say a bit more about that outbreak shortly. I can also report that a total of 270 patients are currently in hospital uh, with confirmed COVID, which is five more than yesterday. And a total of four people last night were in intensive care with confirmed COVID, which is one more than yesterday. Finally, I'm very pleased to say that yet again, during the past 24 hours, no deaths were registered of a patient confirmed through a test in the past uh, 28 days as having COVID. And so the total number of deaths under that measurement remains at 2,491. Uh, we are, of course, reporting fewer deaths uh, on a daily basis now, but the total reminds us of the impact the virus has had on too many families across the country. So again, I want to extend my thoughts to everyone who has lost a loved one. And as always, let me say a big thank you to everyone working hard to help us keep COVID under control and also to deal with its many consequences. Now, there are a few items I want to briefly touch on today before I hand over to the Deputy First Minister. Um, firstly, let me give a further update on that cluster of cases in Aberdeen, which is linked to the Hawthorne Bar in the city. I can confirm that as of now, 27 positive cases have been identified as part of the cluster, though let me be clear, I would expect that number to rise. I can also confirm that so far 120 contacts have been traced through the Test and Protect system. The incident management team, which is led by NHS Grampian, will meet again this afternoon and they continue to take all necessary steps to try to minimise the risk of further transmission. And I'm extremely grateful to all of them for their considerable efforts. Investigations, uh, of course, are ongoing uh, and we will provide more details as and when they become available. However, this uh, particular cluster is another reminder uh, that this virus is still out there and hasn't gone away. It remains extremely infectious and of course it remains extremely dangerous and all of us have a part to play in denying it the opportunities to spread. I talked yesterday about the importance of the test and protect system in helping us to contain these kinds of incidents. So I think it's worth me reminding you of one of the key elements of that system. If you are contacted by a test and protect team and advised that you are a close contact of someone who has tested positive for COVID, you must self-isolate for 14 days. That should be seen as non-negotiable. 
Uh, the team might ask you or arrange for you to take a test. Uh, if they don't do that, you should only book a test yourself if you have symptoms. If you are a close contact of an identified case and you do get tested, and this bit's really important uh, for me to convey very clearly to you, if you do get tested, um, you must self-isolate for 14 days, even if you test negative. And that's because, given what we know about the incubation of this virus, it's entirely possible that you have the virus in your system, uh, but it hasn't had time to develop, so it doesn't show up in the test. For example, on a Monday, you might test negative for the virus, but by the Tuesday, you might have developed the virus without knowing it. And at that point, you could be infectious, and yet it might not be until the Thursday or the Friday that you start to show any symptoms. In fact, you might never show any significant symptoms at all, but if you are not isolating, you could nevertheless still be spreading the virus. And that is really tough uh, to say to people that even if you're testing negative for this virus, if you are a close contact, you have to self-isolate for 14 days. But that is partly what makes this virus so difficult to deal with. But it is also why self-isolation is so important and so necessary. And I want to uh, give a special message to employers. Um, please don't think that testing any of your staff who are deemed to be close contacts of a positive case is an alternative to them self-isolating. That is absolutely not the case, and I must stress that. There are simply no shortcuts here when it comes to trying to contain the spread of this virus. All of us need to comply with the requirements of Test and Protect, otherwise it won't work. Um, and that includes, in fact, possibly the most important element of this is the self-isolation requirement. Uh, if we do all comply, we can help to contain uh, these kinds of incidents when they do occur, and we can ensure that rather going into reverse, we can continue our exit from lockdown. And that brings me to the second point I want to briefly touch on, and that's about how we're trying to track the course of the pandemic here in Scotland. Uh, the daily statistics I share with you obviously provide us with really important information about the spread of the virus. But because of the time it takes uh, COVID to incubate, some of these statistics only reflect what might have been happening in a community two or three weeks previously. And that's one of the reasons why the lockdown restrictions are reviewed every three weeks, because that gives us time to assess the impact of any changes that we make. At this point, of course, as we come further out of lockdown, the risks are heightened and it becomes more important that we have early warning, as early as possible, of any new trends. So that's why we're increasingly looking to use a form of modelling which helps to estimate changes in the epidemic and model and estimate those as early as possible before they come through the daily statistics that I report to you. That modelling just now is carried out by the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and it involves using online surveys to gather information about people's social behaviour. Uh, the surveys are run every two weeks. They ask about a range of different topics from people's contact with others to recent travel to their use of face masks, for example. Now, at the moment, there are very few people from Scotland included in those surveys. So the modelling is of more limited value to us in assessing the particular situation here. So that's why we intend to establish a Scottish version of the survey. It will feed into the other modelling work that's already carried out and it will help to produce results that are more relevant and therefore more applicable to Scotland. We're looking for 3,000 members of the public to take part in this. As a starting point, we're, we're going to be sending invitations to people who have previously been involved in our population surveys. But we will also need volunteers over and above that. So I would urge anyone who is interested to find out more on the Scottish Government's Twitter feed. I'll make sure there's information available there later today. By volunteering, you will be helping us to improve our understanding of the epidemic and you'll be helping to ensure that we can identify and respond quickly to any changes that threaten the progress we've made. Now, finally today, before I conclude, I just want to return uh, to the issue of the SQA results. 138,000 learners from across the country should by now have received their results. And I'm sure that for many of you and for your families, the build-up to this day has been very tense. Uh, and I really do hope that you got the results that you wanted. But if you didn't, and if you're feeling 
disappointed right now, please bear in mind that this is just the beginning. There will be many more opportunities ahead and you do have plenty of options. It's also important to note that there is advice and support there for you if you need it. For example, if you have a question about your results or if you want to appeal the results you've got today, you should contact your school, college or training provider. The SQA is this year running a free appeal service. There's also an SQA candid candidate advice line and I'm about to read out the number for that. You should call the advice line if you have questions about your certificate, for example, if you need help understanding it or if you think there's something missing from it. Uh, that line is open now and the number is 0345 279 1000. Uh, 0345 279 1000. Alternatively, if you want advice or information about what comes next, you can call the Skills Development Scotland dedicated helpline, and I'm going to read that number out in a moment as well. The helpline offers free, impartial advice for young people, parents and carers, and it will help you to learn about your options for the future, whether that's staying on at school, going to college or university, taking an apprenticeship or entering the world of work. So the number for the helpline is 0808 100 8000 0808 100 8000 and I would encourage you if you need a bit of advice to give it a call and again you will find these numbers on the Scottish Government Twitter feed uh, later. All of you uh, have faced huge challenges this year, challenges that previous generations like uh, mine and the Deputy First Ministers could never have imagined um, and so we are determined to do everything we can to make sure you have the support and opportunities you need as you start to think about your future. Now, I'll hand on to the Deputy First Minister now, but before I do, let me just uh, end with the usual facts, advice, the five key things that all of us must remember in everything we do right now. F, face coverings must be worn in shops, public transport and in all enclosed places. A, avoid crowded places, uh, even if they're outdoors. C, clean your hands and hard surfaces regularly. T, two metre distancing remains the rule. And S, self-isolate and book a test immediately if you have symptoms of COVID. Mm. It's vital that we all continue to follow these rules because if we don't, we risk allowing the virus to get a grip of us again. And the consequences of that we know um, are very clear. And we only need to look at what's happening elsewhere in the world uh, to see that countries can go into reverse and restrictions uh, can require to be reimposed. We don't want to have to do that here, but we will have no choice if the virus gets out of control. Um, and all of us, it's the point I was making yesterday, all of us have the power, the agency and indeed the responsibility to minimise the chance of that happening. Uh, and that is why it's vital that we follow and abide by these five rules. So my thanks to everyone who is doing so. It is hugely appreciated. I'll hand over now to the Deputy First Minister, who will say a bit more about today's results before we move on to questions. Thank you, First Minister. There are numerous examples of the serious impact of COVID and the disruption which it has caused. The 2020 exam diet is another example in that long list. There have been exams held every May or June without fail in Scotland for over 130 years, but this year we took the difficult decision that the exam diet had to be cancelled. In these circumstances, I was clear that we would need to do our utmost to ensure that we protect the interests and the life chances of our young people who were due to sit exams from the end of April this year. It's always been imperative that their achievements had to be rightly and fairly recognised. I made it clear that I wanted the 2020 cohort to be able to hold their heads high and gain the qualifications and awards that they deserve after many years of hard work. To this end, Scotland's chief examiner and her staff, working with the wider system, have been able to develop an alternative certification model to allow the awarding of qualifications this year in a manner that is fair to pupils. I want to extend my thanks to all who have enabled this to happen and so ensure that young people in our schools and colleges who, with no fault of their own, have been unable to sit exams and are in no way disadvantaged as a consequence. I would like to extend a special thanks to teachers and lecturers for the exceptional effort that has gone into assessing learners' achievements this year Without teacher and lecturer assessments, it would not have been possible to award young people with qualifications this year. This work means that today is an opportunity to celebrate success and to recognise the hard work of our pupils. It is also an opportunity to recognise success for all learners following a very wide range of learning pathways. 
In addition to the national qualifications, we can see successes across Skills for Work, SQA awards and National Progression awards. And this is in addition to successes across a range of awards which are achieved across the year by our young people. The SQA methodology has been designed to ensure that the standards of qualifications this year has been maintained. Today's results show an increase in the attainment of grades A to C for National 5 of 2.9%, hires of 4.2% and advanced hires of 5.5%, which by any measure should be considered a very good set of results. However, given that the awarding methodology is different this year to any other, the SQA have noted that comparisons to previous years need to be considered with great care. Our young people who have achieved their qualifications this year can be confident that these will stand the test of time and that they have been awarded in a fair and robust manner such that they will allow progression onto the next step of learner journeys or into employment. I recognise that there is understandably significant interest in how these results have been awarded and the Chief Examiner has published a range of materials explaining the methodology employed and the results of it. National moderation has played an important role in this, in this process. However, around three quarters of all grade estimates made had no need for any moderation by the Scottish Qualifications Authority, and where grade estimates were moderated, the vast majority of these estimates, over 93%, were changed by only one grade. Today's results show that without moderation, the rate of attainment at grades A to C compared to last year would have increased by 10.4% at National 5, 14% at higher, and 13.4% for advanced hires. Year-on-year -year change of this scale has never been seen in Scottish exam results. The combination of teacher and lecturer judgment and SQA moderation, therefore, means that young people across Scotland can be sure that the qualifications they have gained this year have the same very high level of credibility and value as qualifications from previous years, and as such, can command the same respect. The very high standards in our curriculum and qualification system have been maintained this year due to the combination of work done by teachers and by the SQA. Whilst there should be confidence in this year's awarding process and the qualifications gained as a result of it, further assurance will be provided by a free post-results appeal service. This appeals process is an integral part of awarding this year and from today it will be open for schools and colleges to lodge appeals on behalf of pupils where they believe there is appropriate and robust evidence to support the original grade estimate. I want to end once again by extending my congratulations and best wishes to those learners who have gained qualifications today across a range of different courses and to those who have not received the grades that they wished for to say to them there is support and advice available to every one of you to assist you in the next steps that you decide to take. Thank you. Uh, many thanks, John. We're also joined today uh, by the Chief Medical Officer, who will uh, be available with uh, the DFM and I to take questions. Uh, we'll now move straight to questions. Uh, David Shanks from BBC Scotland, first up. First Minister, we know the Aberdeen cluster had originated in one specific bar, but since then at least one other bar and a golf club has published statements informing their customers that they've been notified a COVID positive person has visited their premises and then they've taken action. But more than a week on from the initial cluster, should we not be hearing more officially about where else is involved rather than social media statements from pubs so people can find out if they've been affected? Um, thanks for the question, David. And you'll know from previous updates I've given on other outbreaks that uh, you know that that is a valid question. The, the incident management team here is leading uh, both the investigation and the response, and will uh, give advice about the steps that require to be taken. Uh, that will be around uh, the, the contacts that need to be followed up, but also any uh, public notification of other locations. And uh, if it is deemed to be the case that other notifications uh, require to be made in order to assist with the management of uh, this outbreak, that will happen. And I, you know, uh, a couple of weeks ago or thereabouts uh, announced from this podium uh, some locations that had been associated with the outbreak in, in Lanarkshire. Uh, but these decisions have to be properly uh, taken uh, in the, the context of the overall management of the outbreak. I, I think uh, almost certainly there will be more information uh, to come out of the Aberdeen outbreak uh, in addition to 
the steps that the incident management team uh, will be taking and the work uh, that it is leading. Uh, the government will also be looking at whether there are any uh, wider implications and consequences for our policy approach uh, to, to tackling COVID. And uh, I'm not getting ahead of those decisions, uh, but we will continue to act very uh, much on a, a precautionary basis to try to do everything that is required to contain uh, this, this outbreak. And we will keep uh, the public uh, regularly and fully updated. Oliver Dickinson from STV. Thank you, First Minister. Uh, you said previously that people who were unwilling to hand over their details at bars, pubs and restaurants simply shouldn't go. How confident are you that A, people are doing this, that B, pubs, bars and restaurants are actively collecting such data? And would you consider making it mandatory rather than voluntary for such information to be handed over when someone attends such a venue? Um, so in relation to the, the second part of your question, yes, we will consider that if we, we deem that to be necessary and, and that could you know, involve putting an obligation legally on uh, the, the, the operators of a pub or a restaurant to gather that information. Uh, so you know, my answer here, I suppose, is, is specific to the question you've asked me, but more general. We will not shy away from doing the things that we think are necessary to keep this virus under control because not keeping it under control has you know, horrible consequences that we don't want to contemplate. Um, my view, um, not just in terms of people giving and having the contact details gathered when they go to pubs and restaurants, but my view overall in terms of compliance with everything that we're asking people to do is that the vast majority are doing it. Um, you know, as I've said, over the past few days here. I think all of us need to check ourselves and make sure that we're not letting standards slip. But I do have a worry about two metre distancing um, because I see with my own eyes, you know, on, on the streets and I, I know how difficult it is in, in you know, day-to-day -day life to, to remember to keep two metres distance from people in other households. So I've got a bit of a worry that we've all let standards slip there. Uh, but I think the vast majority of people want to do the right things. Um, to those who you know, are not complying either because they haven't perhaps taken the time to familiarise themselves with the advice or for whatever reason uh, that is inexplicable to me, they don't want to comply with these things, I'd say please think again. Because by not complying, you are putting yourself at risk, but you're also putting people around you at risk as well. And, and so just think about all of this. I, I would say generally here, and, uh, and I hope people take uh, this in the sentiment it's intended. None of what we're asking people to do right now is done lightly. I, I genuinely don't like asking people to have restrictions in how they live their lives because I, I don't like living with these restrictions. I don't want to be advising other people to do so. But it's all been done for a reason because we, we base these things on the evidence and the knowledge, which is still changing, I should say, but the evidence and knowledge we have right now of the the risks of transmission, how we think this virus spreads. So everything we're asking you to do has a reason and a purpose. And it's also the case that if you don't do these things, you are giving the virus a chance to spread because all of these things are intended to, to deny it uh, that chance to spread. So please, you know, don't think you're, you're somehow, you know, putting one over on politicians like me by, uh, by not complying with these things. Um, you're, you're putting yourself at risk and you're putting your loved ones at risk and you're putting the community you live in and the country at risk by doing that. Gregor, do you want to say a bit more about the importance of these public health measures? So we're all dealing with a huge amount of change in our lives just now, still um, dealing with change and um, we're getting used to new ways of visiting different businesses and, and, and using, uh, leaving our details with, with, with them as well. I can't emphasise enough to people just now the real importance of making sure that we are sticking with the guidance as it is just now. You know, there's, a, there's a little bit of concern that I begin to have that some of us have become a little complacent when I see uh, the way that people are reacting, when I see some pictures which have been presented in social media. I don't think it's the majority by any manner of means because I think the majority are really keen to make sure that we stick with this and stick with it well. But I think that for some people, um, it is perhaps people have begun to um, perhaps become just a little bit lax in the way we approach this. I can't emphasise enough the public health basis as to why we're asking people to do this. Because if you go into an establishment, you've not left your, you left your contact details, but there is someone who turns out to be positive for COVID there. 
How are people going to get in contact with you? How are people going to tell you that you're then at risk, maybe advise you to get a test, maybe be able to advise you about what steps to take to protect your relatives? That's the reason that we're asking people to do this. We really need you to stick to this guidance, to leave your details, to leave them accurately so that you can be contacted afterwards. While you're at these businesses, to make sure that you're following facts, that you're wearing face coverings if that's appropriate, that you're avoiding crowded places. In fact, I would question if you're arriving at a business who wasn't asking you for your contact details, well, certainly for me, I, I, I wouldn't go in. I would, I would turn around and go somewhere else. But that you're making sure that you're cleaning your hands regularly when you're out and about as well, that you're making sure that the surfaces that are around about you are being cleaned uh, as well. But that two, -meter wheel, that two meter rule still stays at the forefront of your brain whenever you're interacting with the outside world. And if you do get symptoms, that you're immediately phoning up to book an appointment so that you can get tested and that you self-isolate, but also that any of your household members self-isolate until you know that test result as well. That's what is going to make the difference in the longer term as we deal with COVID. Thanks, very good. Uh, Keenan Jenkins from Channel 4. Hello, um, I'd like to ask you about the school results and the proportion of A to C grades that were reduced down against the teachers' estimates. For the most deprived pupils, the results were reduced against the teachers' estimates by 15.2%. For the best off pupils, the results were reduced by just 6.9%. Can you look a young person from those most deprived backgrounds in the eye today and say, this system is fair? Um, I'm going to hand over to Deputy First Minister, but I want to have a go at doing that myself. And before I, I do that, I understand uh, how difficult it will be for any young person out there, whatever their background, uh, if the result they have been given today is lower than they were expecting based on the, the estimate that was put forward. And that is why the availability of appeals is so important. Every young person that's in that position will have the opportunity uh, to appeal and if there has been a, a misjudgment made there, the opportunity to have that rectified. And I think that's really important. Today is not the end uh, of the journey. On the issue particularly about uh, young people living in our most deprived areas uh, compared to those in our, our least deprived areas, the one thing I think it's really important to to, to be clear, is we have and we know we have an attainment gap in education. Uh, poorer young people don't do as well as uh, more affluent young people. And that is something we are working very, very hard from the early years right through our school system to try to uh, rectify. I think the thing to, to be very clear about, though, is that this system of moderation that has been required this year is not what is causing that attainment gap. So let me put this another way. If, if we hadn't had that system of moderation, we'd be standing here today uh, saying, and the Deputy First Minister will have the table in front of him here, without that system of moderation, I would be saying that 85% of young people in our most deprived areas had passed hires this year, compared to around 65% last year and in previous years. And you, Kieran, would probably be saying to me, that 20% increase in a single year is unprecedented and therefore not credible. Um, so that system of moderation has been necessary. What it has resulted in uh, this year, and I'm, I'm given overall statistics, I go back to what I said earlier on about the ability for individuals to appeal, but this year with that system of moderation, um, I think 69.9%, so around 70% of young people in our most deprived areas have passed hires which is an increase on the around 65% uh, last year. Uh, so the, the performance has improved with all the caveats about comparisons because there was no exams this year. So this is really difficult. Um, but overall, uh, that moderation, I think, is, is necessary to make sure we have a credible, um, and that's important for young people, system of results. But to end my contribution where I started, for every individual young person, that ability to appeal and test that is really, really important. John. Thanks, First Minister. Uh, there's two points that I would add to, to what you've said. The first is that in the results that have been announced today, the gap in the performance between the young people from the most deprived backgrounds to the least deprived backgrounds has narrowed 
compared to 2019. Now, the reverse was predicted by those who criticised the way in which we proposed to proceed with the certification of performance in this way. So we've seen a closing of the gap between young people from the most deprived to the least deprived backgrounds. And that demonstrates that inherently this system has been fair to all learners. What it hasn't done, as the First Minister has said, has made the long-standing attainment gap in Scottish education, which is the focus of all the work that I'm taking forward in education policy, somehow disappear in one exam diet. And the second point I would make, and this is a, and the First Minister has made this point, but I do want to reiterate it. It is vital that any young person, in consultation with their school, who believes that they have got a result which is not appropriate and unfair and they should have done better, has the right to appeal against that uh, judgment. And I would encourage them to consider that evidence and to come forward to make sure that young people are able to have confidence in the in the certification process that we have gone through. Thanks. Uh, Alan Smith from Bower. Thanks very much, First Minister. Just looking again at the, the exams issue, I think it's fair to say that there is lots of hurt and anger at the, the downgrading we've seen today. One frustrated teacher has told Radio Clyde that it's a shambles uh, and has questioned how someone at the SQA can know their students better than they do. So how do you respond to claims that teachers have been treated with contempt and secondly in response to Kieran's question you're pointing towards the appeals process but if someone has no confidence in how the uh, result was awarded in the first place how can they have confidence in the appeals process? Well, again uh, I, I would reject uh, absolutely any notion that teachers have been treated in the way you have uh, described there. Uh, to go back to a point the Deputy First Minister um, made, I think, in his opening remarks, three quarters of all grades have not required any moderation. Um, but they're required to be a, a system of moderation um, in order to give an added level of assurance that the results this year uh, were uh, credible, because that's important for young people. And I'll go back to uh, the point uh, that I made earlier on. Um, if I look at if, if we take the if you take the the twenty percent most deprived, the estimates would have at the eighty five point one percent of young people passing hires. Now I, I desperately want to get to a, a position in Scottish education where eighty five percent of young people in these categories pass hires. But last year it was sixty five point three. The year before that, uh, in fact, the, the three years before that, it was around sixty eight. Now if we had said today that 85% had passed compared to those figures, all of the questions we'd have been getting here today, I think with some credibility, is how have you managed in one year to have that increase? Now, what that says is that system of moderation was necessary. Now, the, the point I will readily make is that it's easy for me to stand here because I want to make sure that the results, even although they've not been based on exams this year, are going to be uh, credible and recognised so that young people have the confidence of that. But it's easy for me to talk about that in an overall sense. For any individual young person who feels disappointed by the results, that process of appeal is there and it is important. And I think we've got to uh, make sure that young people have that confidence uh, of being able to, to take advantage of that. Thanks, First Minister. I would simply reiterate the point that in three out of every four of the teacher estimates that have come forward have been sustained by the SQA process, so they have required no moderation, no change whatsoever. But what we had to make sure is that young people in 2020, in receiving their qualifications, would be able to demonstrate that their qualifications were robust, that they had been fairly awarded and appropriately awarded by the SQA. Now, I accept that that is a difficult message to put across, but fundamentally it shouldn't disguise the fact that within these results there is a very strong performance by young people in a very good set of results where we've seen the pass rate at National 5, at higher and at advanced higher, all increase. Um, but what we've had to make sure is that those increases were credible within the standards set by the SQA, and that's exactly what's been deployed in this set of results.
And as a point not to lose sight of, and I know it doesn't give any comfort to a young person who is disappointed today, but the pass rates are up. Uh, so performance has improved, even taking account of that process of moderation. Uh, and I guess the, the other point to make is, you know, like so much of what we're dealing with in COVID right now, we, we wish we weren't in, in this position. I, I wish fervently with everything I've got that young people have been able to sit their exams as normal this year. That wasn't possible. Uh, and therefore, what we have done is put in place a system that I know will cause concerns for people who are disappointed, but a system that allows us to say, to look young people in the eye and say your results are credible and you deserve to feel uh, proud of them. And if you're disappointed in them, you deserve to have the opportunity to put forward evidence and have uh, that process tested. Uh, Jack Foster from Global. Um, good afternoon. Um, it's a question really for the Education Secretary um, following on from what we've been talking about exams. Given uh, what looks like will probably be an inevitable, um, sorry, I, I slipped away there. Um, given what uh, looks like an inevitable avalanche of appeals across Scotland following um, a quarter of grades being adjusted by the SQA, despite what teachers had decided in order apparently to fit a, a, a statistical model, um, well, I have two points which I wonder if you could answer. One, are you able to tell us how many marks have been downgraded that resulted in candidates being awarded a fail? And secondly, are you going to be intervening to ensure that this appeals process is able to cope with what are likely to be high numbers um, and indeed to ensure that in, in that instance it will be fair? The appeal process is established and the SQA is ready to receive those appeals. Uh, priority will be given to the young people who require appeals to be determined at the earliest opportunity to enable them to take forward higher and further education offers that they have and may be conditional on these res results. So I would encourage anyone in those circumstances uh, to make uh, swift uh, actions to, to take that forward. And uh, we will make sure, and the SQA have made sure already, that they have the capacity to handle the volume of appeals that come forward. And it's important that in all circumstances uh, that happens. Now, in relation to the, uh, the wider question on the moderation process, um, over 90% of uh, the estimates that have been downgraded have been downgraded by simply one grade. And what that means is that these are very fine judgments that are being arrived at in relation to the performance of individual students. And if young people believe that there is a merit and, uh, and their schools believe there is merit to bring forward evidence to support an appeal, that's exactly what they should do. Uh, Fraser Nicholl from uh, Original 106. Do we know that there are, do we know if there's any numbers with regards to how many people have been downgraded to a fail? Well, th th there will obviously be movement from A to C to, um, to a D and to no award, and those numbers are published by the SQA. Fraser Nicol from Original 106. Thank you, First Minister. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'm not sure if you've seen, but the bar in Aberdeen, where the large crowds were pictured over the weekend, has now closed until further notice over safety concerns. Now, you said, you said yesterday you wanted to focus on avoiding a further blanket shutdown of hospitality firms and pubs, although you have warned that that could happen if people don't follow the rules. Can I ask you, if you were forced to close them again, what support would be in place to prevent job losses and the potential collapse of these businesses, given that the furlough scheme is now coming to an end? And just secondly, if I may, uh, you said if you've, if you've been contacted by the test and protect team, self-isolating should be seen as non-negotiable. Can I ask, are there specific concerns that contacts traced in relation to the outbreak at the Hawthorne Bar in Aberdeen were not isolating and, in fact, uh, possibly even in the crowds pictured outside bars at the weekend? I'm going to be very careful here not to get too speculative in what I talk about because I don't think it's helpful. We want to try to give uh, solid information to people. So I'm not going to speculate about whether people who, um, you know, should have been isolating weren't isolating. But, you know, we all, uh, I have a concern that people uh, might think if they get a, a negative test during the 14-day self-isolation period, then they don't need to finish that 14-day isolation period. And, and, you know, I don't know whether anybody did that, but I want to be absolutely clear with people that if you're identified as a close contact, remember there's definitions of what that means, um, and Test and Protect would get in touch with you. If they get in touch with you to say you are a close contact of somebody who has been 
uh, identified as a positive case, you must isolate for 14 days. You must isolate for 14 days. And if you get tested yourself and it's negative, that doesn't release you from that self-isolation because the negative test does not mean that you don't have the virus or will not develop it because of the incubation period. And and I really wanted to take the opportunity today because I know this is all complex. We're all trying to understand these rules that we're having to live under now that we've not been used to. So I want to, to make that very clear and, and take the opportunity to, to do that. Um, I've not seen uh, what you refer to in terms of the, uh, the bar. I'd repeat the, the point I made yesterday. This is a, a collective responsibility. Um, of course, uh, employers and uh, operators of premises like pubs and restaurants have got a big responsibility to make sure that their venues uh, abide by all the rules. But every single one of us has a responsibility to make sure that we're abiding by the rules. Um, and if we all do it, then these problems are less likely to occur. Um, obviously, the furlough scheme is still in uh, place and there's still the opportunity of that. But I have a concern about the ending of the furlough scheme. And we've made very clear and will continue to make clear to the UK government that that is a mistake. Uh, that given what we are seeing, given what is being seen right now in the north of England, given what we are seeing in Aberdeen, we will undoubtedly see more of these outbreaks there requires to be a flexibility of financial support on an ongoing basis. Because when we take these decisions or are faced with taking these decisions, we should really be able to act on the basis of public health requirements. Uh, and that means if a business has been asked to close for a period, uh, there should be support there. Now, the Scottish Government does not hold all of these levers, unfortunately. So that means we do have to make that case to the UK government, which has been good uh, in terms of the support it's provided so far. But it's really important that we try to avoid that support being uh, taken away prematurely. Neil Puran from PA. Thanks, First Minister. If I can ask about the exam results. Uh, do you think some of the anxiety around the results that came out today and some of the upset that's been uh, caused in, in some pupils might have been avoided if the methodology had been published earlier? Would that maybe have helped people understand the process a bit better? And secondly, uh, teachers will obviously be preparing for the return to school in uh, a few days' time now, and they'll obviously be returning in uh, very different circumstances than they would pre-COVID. Do you think that might um, affect the capacity and the ability to, to deal with the uh, appeals as they come through? Um, I'll, I'll hand over to Deputy First Minister. Just briefly for me, you know, I, I, you know, I don't underestimate the, uh, the pressure on teachers right now um, and you know, would take the opportunity to uh, convey my appreciation for the work that teachers are doing and will be doing as schools return. This is not an easy uh, situation for anybody, um, particularly those working on the front line of any of our public services uh, right now. And on the first point, you know, I, I suspect and I, I, I bitterly regret we're in this position, but this system is different this year to previous years by necessity. And therefore, almost inevitably, I think people will have greater anxiety around it. And government has a, an even bigger responsibility to, to try to provide the avenues for people who do have a, a concern that they've perhaps not been given the right result, but also the responsibility to demonstrate overall that anybody who has a result uh, and, and has passed a higher or a national five today can hold their head up for having a credible exam result, um, albeit without the, the, the actual exam. And that's why the, the methodology and the moderation system is important in order that we can do that so that people don't look at incredible inflation of pass rates and say, Ugh, the whole system uh, wasn't wasn't in some way credible. So this is difficult, really difficult for young people, uh, but we absolutely are determined to make sure that there is not a disadvantage because of the peculiar circumstances that people have gone through this year. I think first of all, I'd just simply add that the methodology that's been used here, um, the uh, SK has worked on according to a certain number of principles, and absolutely at the heart of those principles was the importance of fairness to all learners. And they've published today the equalities assessment of all of that, which goes into considerable detail about how the methodology was constructed to make sure there was no um, bias in any way against uh, pupils in any respect whatsoever. So the protection of individuals and the exercise of fairness towards individuals has been at the heart of this process. And then in relation to the the 
preparations for the school term. I, I, I don't doubt the challenges that the education system faces. But this morning I was at uh, Stonelaw High School in Rutherglen today where I met uh, staff and pupils. And the overwhelming message I got there was that they wanted to get back into school. They wanted to get on with supporting and encouraging young people, uh, of working with young people. And yes, that might involve work on um, exam appeals. Um, it will also involve getting young people settled into what will be a very changed and different educational environment. But they were absolutely motivated to do exactly that. And I took part in a conference call by video with a number of schools around the country in the Western Isles, in Orkney, in Argyll, um, in Aberdeenshire and in Murray. And in all of those circumstances, there was a lot of enthusiasm for getting back into education and taking forward the opportunities that quite clearly young people have been missing over the course of the last five months. Okay, um, I'm making pretty slow progress through these questions uh, today. We've still got a lot of questions to take, um, so still trying to give full answers. Uh, I'll try to speed up a little bit and uh, maybe not uh, go over ground we've already covered, although these issues are obviously really important. Uh, but next up is Mark McLaughlin from The Times. Good afternoon. Um, there was a Scottish Government official tweeting this morning that his um, child's results were, were nonsense. It's clear from the, the opposition party's responses that they believe that the, the moderation process is, is somehow run roughshod over teacher judgment. So bearing in mind all of the, the things that you said about the moderation process, it's very clear that you're going to have an almighty row on your hands when, when you get back to Parliament. What, can you, what are you going to say to teachers um, who believe that their judgment is, is just being cast aside by this process? I'm not going to repeat everything I've said. Um, three quarters of uh, grades were not moderated, and I think that's an important starting point. But I come back to the point that if I was standing here uh, telling you today, Mark, that 85% of uh, the 20% most deprived had passed hires this year compared to 65% last year, or that 91.5% uh, 91 uh, of the the 20% uh, least deprived uh, compared to 81% last year had passed hires, you would be saying to me, First Minister, that is not credible that you've had such an increase in, in pass rates in one year because it has never happened uh, before. So that would be the alternative position. And that doesn't make it easy, but we have to have a system that gives uh, overall confidence in the results that we're publishing. And I believe we have that while still allowing for young people who feel, in, in some cases legitimately, that their own particular circumstances have not been properly factored into this. And that is what we are, are seeking to do. And I would encourage opposition uh, politicians to look at the figures and to ask themselves some of these questions. If we hadn't had the system of moderation, imagine what questions they would have been posing and what the almighty row uh, they might have been trying to create today. Uh, so these are not easy situations, not least for the young people involved, but we are trying to make sure we have a, a credible uh, system of results that young people can take confidence in. And I believe overall we have that, and the appeals system is there to make sure that individual concerns can be addressed. Okay. Okay. Um, Dan Sanderson from The Telegraph. Uh, thanks very much, First Minister. Um, it's been uh, over a week now since we heard there was going to be a, a sort of four nations statement on um, tackling coronavirus. I was just hoping you could give us an update on you know how those talks are going. Are there uh, is there still the plan, or has there been um, you know some difficulty reaching an agreement? And also on the exam results, if I just ask the Deputy First Minister from a slightly different angle. You say these are robust and credible, but across National 5 higher and advanced higher, they're actually the highest figures we've seen in five years across all, all three. I mean, advanced higher, I think 84.9% got an A to C, and the next highest was 817 Presumably this is going to go higher with the appeals process. So how would you respond to the claim that you know these aren't credible because they're, they're too high and perhaps haven't been moderated down enough? Thanks. I think in one fell swoop, you've just made my argument uh, that, that I've been trying to, to make uh, throughout this. I'll, I'll hand over to the Deputy First Minister on that point. On the Four Nations statement, um, 
hopefully we'll get agreement on that. The Scottish Government has uh, provided draft wording um, and discussions with the other three nations are ongoing um, and I would hope they would conclude positively and we'd see something uh, published uh, soon. Uh, last Friday, when there was a Four Nations discussion with the Prime Minister, he certainly was enthusiastic about the, uh, the idea of having that Four Nations uh, agreement, but obviously we need to make sure that we are agreed around what we are agreeing to be in that statement. For me, it's uh, the reason I put forward this suggestion is I think it would help all of us if there was a Four Nations commitment to what I would describe as elimination uh, of COVID, driving it to the lowest possible levels and keeping it there to provide the, the best foundation for rebuilding our economy. So that's what uh, we're seeking to get agreement on and hopefully that will happen uh, soon. John. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. In, in, in your question, Dan, you essentially highlight the, the dilemma that lies at the heart of the analysis of these exam results. And that is that if the pass rate is too high, then people will simply say the results are not credible. And that's why moderation has been required to make sure that the results this year um, are able to be considered within the normal round of volatility that you will have in exam results year on year. And I think the results this year are a strong and robust uh, set of results. Um, they are within the, um, the, the volatility that you get from year to year within different exam diets. And I think young people should be very confident in the results that they've acquired. Thank you. Uh, Adele Merson from the P&J. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, Sol Bar and Aberdeen issued a statement which states that one of the positive cases from the Hawthorne Bar had visited the outdoor area of their establishment on Friday. They claimed yesterday that they had not been contacted by the NHS or Test and Protect to confirm this, but they had proactively contacted them themselves. The company which runs Sol PB Devco confirmed just this morning that they feel they now need to take the situation into their own hands and have closed the venue until they feel it's safe to open. Is the test and protect system robust if venues are having to carry out their own tracing? And do you think other pubs in the city should follow suit to close their doors? If I uh, at any stage think that that should be the case, I will say it and I will say it up front and proactively. I won't wait to say it in, in response to a question. And I, I, I don't mean that to criticise the question, but I, I will give any advice that we're going to give uh, straight down that camera and explain the reasons for it. I, I'm not going to comment speculatively on the, the circumstances you've just described. I, I, I do believe Test and Protect is robust. It's a system that is not entirely new. We've always had contact tracing in place, but it is a system that has scaled up significantly to meet the, the scale of the challenge COVID presents. So it will be under pressure in uh, outbreaks uh, and we will require as we go along to make sure that we uh, we learn any lessons and we you know, increase its effectiveness if we need to do that. But again, I want to pay tribute to those who are working in that because they're doing an incredible amount of very difficult work and I think they're doing that very well. They will be making judgments based on all of the, the guidance and the definition about who should be contacted as, uh, as contacts. Uh, and of course, if any uh, you know, businesses have concerns, then of course they should uh, raise those concerns. Uh, but it's really important that we allow the experts on the ground to manage uh, these incidents and make sure that they have the wherewithal to do that. And that's uh, what we'll do in Aberdeen and in any other situations that we may face over the, the next period. Christine Lavelle from The Sun. Thanks, First Minister. Uh, it was just following on from that on the Aberdeen cluster. Um, NHS Grampian's Deputy Director of Public Health was quoted today warning of potential curfews or a local lockdown in the city uh, if further positive cases and clusters are identified. Are any restrictions being considered currently for Aberdeen and at what point would we see a local lockdown being import, uh, imposed? Again, Christine, you've heard me say this before, I'm, I'm trying to strike the right balance here between not allowing hairs to run before we've taken decisions, because that doesn't help anybody, but also uh, making the obvious points that all of these things have to be under review on an ongoing basis, because we're dealing with an infectious virus, and therefore we have to, you know, it's a, it's a tactical battle we're fighting here with this virus, and so we have to, you know, always consider the steps we need to take to stay ahead of it or, or get it back in retreat if we ever think it's running out of control. I'll be, you know, having discussions over the course of today into tomorrow, looking at what the incident management team is doing, looking at the uh, the evidence that is available to us about the cases in Aberdeen. Obviously, we've got a, 
a relatively high number of cases reported today in Grampian, so we want to know uh, whether uh, these are cases already included in the 27 or whether there's new cases here. So we'll be looking at all of this and making judgments about whether the IMT in the things that they're doing have this under control or whether we need to step in and do anything further. And these are not going to be easy judgments in Aberdeen or in any other area where these situations arise, but they're judgments we'll try to take uh, both on a precautionary basis, but not in a way that is disproportionate or overreacting. And uh, I think the key point is if we do take any decisions, we will communicate them, try to communicate them as clearly, as coherently, um, and uh, as rationally as, as we possibly can. But in the meantime, my appeal to everybody is to help uh, those who are trying to keep this virus under control do their jobs by doing your jobs, which is to comply with all the, the guidance and advice that we're asking you to. Do you want to say any more, Gregor, about... So, so I think the main, the main thing that um, I, I would take from the, the process so far is that, that, yes, the number of cases that have, have um, appeared in Aberdeen just now that are linked to the Hawthorne Barn is of concern, but the test and protect system has done its job in that it's identified those chains of transmission just now. What would make me increasingly uneasy if in new cases that were being identified, we were unable to identify those chains of transmission, how those people were contracting COVID-19. Now, at the moment, there's no evidence uh, that that's the case at all, but we continue to keep a very close eye on exactly um, the, the, the mechanisms by which people have tested positive and, and how they've come by that. And that's the job of the IMT to do that and to provide us with advice as to how their assessment of how this outbreak is being controlled or indeed contained. Uh, Tom Martin from The Express. Hi, thank you, First Minister. Um, one perhaps more for the Deputy First Minister. Um, yesterday, the EIS wrote you asking for some urgent changes surrounding some of the safety measures um, for getting schools back next week, particularly around social distancing amongst older people, well, between staff and older pupils, and as well um, on the issue of um, looking more towards routine testing. I just wondered, given it's less than a week away, can can actually any of these changes, what they're asking for, be met? And is next week's reopening in jeopardy if, if they're not on board? The schools will reopen next next week. Um, they'll start reopening on Tuesday. And as we set out to Parliament last week, that will be undertaken on a phased basis. And I'm very confident that staff are keen to get back into school, although the legitimate concerns of staff have got to be addressed. And that's why we'll engage, as we have done for months, on a perpetual basis, constructively with the EIS to address these questions. In relation to physical distancing, we uh, have set out in the guidance the fact that teachers should be able to, uh, staff should be uh, operating um, physically distant from pupils within schools, and that is part of the guidance, so that should be followed in all circumstances. In relation to the question of uh, testing, uh, we have set out the arrangements for the, um, the, the application of the test and protect regime within schools. We've also set out proposals for enhanced surveillance testing, and there's obviously some suggestions in the EIS letter, which the Health Secretary and I are actively considering just now. And we will, of course, respond to the EIS in a timious basis on these points. I think the last point I would make is this, and that is that the, we've, we've set out the guidance based on the best information that we have available, available to us just now. That's not to say that as we go forward, we won't change and revise that advice and put in other provision when we see the experience within individual schools. So what I would say is that we are actively engaged in dialogue with the teaching professional associations and with other staff unions to make sure we understand all of the issues and if we need to change guidance, we are willing to do so in the future should that be required. Uh, uh, Andrew Learman from The National. Uh, thanks, First Minister. Um, uh, you said that without moderation, 85% of young people in our most deprived areas would have passed highest compared to 65%, um, or was around 65% last year. Uh, that's a, a huge gap. Do we know why that is? Why there's such a big gap? Um, is it because teachers have overestimated their pupils' ability? Or, or is it, as some teachers are suggesting on social media, because exams and the current system of testing is inherently unequal? 
there is an attainment gap in our education system. So, you know, last year, 81% of the top 20% uh, in, in affluence terms uh, got hires and 65% in, in the bottom 20% got hires. So that gap is there. And that's why from the early years through to access to university, we're trying to tackle that. The point I am making is that it is not this system of moderation that has caused that gap. As the Deputy First Minister said, performance has actually increased this year and the gap has narrowed, um, so, but it is still there and one that we need to continue to work to address. I, I, I'd simply echo the, the point the First Minister has made, that in these results um, we have seen a narrowing of the gap between pupils from the most deprived to the least deprived uh, groupings. And that demonstrates that the process of moderation of itself has not done what some critics suggested it would do, which is to penalise uh, young people from the most deprived backgrounds. We are painfully aware that we have an attainment gap in Scottish education. That is what the Scottish Attainment Challenge, what pupil equity funding, what the expansion of early years education, what the widening access programme to higher education is all about to make sure that we uh, close that gap for young people within Scotland. But we couldn't expect a system of moderation to do that. And what we see from these results, that system of moderation has not in any way penalised young people from disadvantaged backgrounds. Uh, Connor uh, Matchett from The Scotsman. Thank you, First Minister. And um, so a question for, for both yourself and, and the Education Secretary, if possible. And um, we've heard a lot today in responses to these questions about the fact that the historical comparisons between 2020 and previous years aren't really credible because we're not in normal circumstances. However, the sole justification, seemingly, but for the SQA's moderation process is historical data. How can we please have some explanation as to how that is the case? Was there anything else that justified the SQA's um, moderation system? And secondly, does this not show that statistical modelling and governmental credibility is more important to the grades and the grades being awarded to pupils than pupil work? No, absolutely emphatically not. What matters to the government and what matters to young people is the credibility of the results. Now, obviously, we haven't had exams this year, so you have to be cautious about exact comparisons from this year uh, to previous years because there's been a different system in place. That seems to me to be self-evident. Uh, but what we want to make sure is that this year's results um, have... Uh, the, the degree of credibility that means that they are not so out of sync with previous years that people are going to look at them and say they don't make any sense. And I come back to this point, you know, much as I would love to be in the position of standing here credibly saying that 85% uh, of the 20% the, the in the most deprived areas had passed hires, given that it was 65% last year, that would raise a real credibility issue because you would then be asking me what explains that 20-point increase in the space of one year? Now, as it happens, after the moderation, 69.9% of that cohort have passed higher. So it is up on last year, but it is a level of increase that is more in line with what you would expect year on year in an exam system. So this is about, not, it's not about the credibility of the government. You know, if, if we hadn't done the moderation, I'd be standing here as First Minister saying 85% pass compared to 65%, look at the, the great increase. Um, but I'm not sure you would be believing me. Um, so this is about the credibility of the results that young people have so that every young person, and I believe this is the case, notwithstanding the points about the, the availability of appeals for individuals, but if you, as a young person, uh, are sitting there today with an A pass higher, you can have confidence uh, that that is a credible uh, and well-earned result that you can hold your head up high and feel as proud of this year as you would have done had it been last year. And that's the credibility that matters. Just two, two other points I would add to what the First Minister has said. Um, the first is that three out of every four teacher estimates have been maintained without any moderation. And that's the overwhelming majority of estimates. So I think we... We, we do have to bear that in mind as we carry out this analysis. And the second point is that where there has been moderation, over 90% of that moderation has involved a change of just one grade. 
So what, what is essentially been highlighted there is about judgments which are really quite finely grained to be made within uh, an education system. Uh, so we've maintained the overwhelming majority of estimates that have been put forward by teachers and the changes that have been made are essentially those fine-grained judgments that require to be made on an annual basis. But notwithstanding all of that, if young people feel they haven't got the, the results to which they were entitled, then with their schools they can bring forward evidence to a free appeals process to enable them to try to secure the result which they believe they're entitled to. David Ball from the Herald. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Uh, following on from Connor's question, um, part of the moderation process um, has included taking account of schools' past performance. Uh, given that that's inevitably going to hit pupils from deprived um, backgrounds and schools hardest, how content are you with that methodology being used? And can I also ask about um, hospital emissions, which appear to have uh, sort of slightly increased over the last few days for the first time in a while? Um, are you expecting that to increase further? And is the NHS um, sort of braced for a further increase, given that cases are also increasing? Um, I'll hand over to uh, John on the, the point about moderation and, and the methodology there. On hospital admissions, I suppose I'd say two seemingly um, contradictory things at the same time. One is, you know, we, we see an increase, I think, of five today in, in hospital admissions. You know, we, we shouldn't read too much into one day. Equally, we know that we possibly are, are just seeing a bit of an uptick in in cases. Um, most of those we think right now are associated with clusters and outbreaks, not necessarily a, a, an uptick in broader community transmission, but we're looking at that very, very carefully. So at the moment, the data leads me back, all of the data leads me back to the same point, which is this virus is still a real threat and it's, it's still out there. And that's basically what every one of us should have in our heads when we get up in the morning and leave our houses until we get home at night and, and go to bed. The virus is still out there. If you're in a room somewhere or if you're meeting people in other households, even if it's outside, just assume that it's around you. Uh, and then if you think with that mindset, you, you might be a bit more conscious of the things you've got to do to try to, to stop it transmitting. So the data don't... We shouldn't get carried away at the moment and overstate things, but equally... The data in Scotland, the data across the UK, some of what's happening worldwide, if we're not hearing these warnings, then we're, we're not paying attention. Um, and that is my main message. We've got to pay attention to the fine changes in all of this so that we can try to act before it runs out of control. John, do you want to take the yeah, example? Thanks, First Minister. In the methodology that the SQ has taken forward, um, the first part of it at a centre level involves essentially allowing centres a degree of flexibility in the estimation that they have brought forward. And if that estimation is within reasonable parameters, then the SQA essentially left the results as they were. And it's only when it comes to the exercise of moderation does the SQA look at particular uh, past performance. So that's taking into account changes in performance and developments that have been made by individual schools. But I come back to the point that if a young person believes that they have not had a result to which they have the evidence that they were entitled, then they should appeal as part of this process. And we are uh, creating the space and the opportunity for young people to appeal any results with which they are dissatisfied to make sure in these very unusual circumstances that young people are able to exhaust every opportunity to get satisfaction about the results that uh, to which they think they're entitled. Thank you. Uh, Rachel Watson from the Daily Mail. Thank you, First Minister. Um, just to follow up on the point about appeals there, we've obviously heard a lot of anger and upset at the moderation of results and pupils being urged to appeal if they feel that they didn't get the results they deserve. If there is a mass of successful appeals, should there be a review into the process and how this all happened. And also just following up from Christine's question on local lockdowns, um, I realise you don't want to be too speculative about it, but if there are local lockdowns, would this likely inclu include schools closing in areas as well? Um, I'll hand over to uh, John on the point about appeals. Yeah, 
it's not that I, I'm trying to avoid answering these questions. I, I, I try not to avoid answering questions in these briefings, but it doesn't help me. It doesn't, sorry, it doesn't help other people if I stand up here and just speculate about what might or might not happen. Uh, we're in a fast-moving situation sometimes around this virus uh, where, you know, really difficult things have to be done. And I try to operate on the basis if if a decision is taken, we need to communicate it. And of course, there's all sorts of discussions about the factors that underpin these decisions. But I don't want people uh, getting, you know, maybe hearing if they're not watching this briefing and they hear that I've said something about shutting pubs, you know, in a couple of days, they get the wrong end of the stick that that's a decision. So I, I want to try and communicate decisions, uh, not speculations about decisions. But your point about schools is a, a good one, actually. And Again, please don't take this as an indication of any decisions we're going to take because it's not. But over the next period, um, if hypothetically, whether it's in Aberdeen or any other part of the country, we were to take decisions uh, that perhaps put more restrictions on people to try to avoid spread of the virus, that might be because we are trying to protect the ability of schools to get back and stay open. You've heard me say before that that is the priority. And therefore, there are some things that I know people wish we were doing over the next few weeks that we're not because we don't want to jeopardise getting schools back. So some of this, you know, it, it is possible that if we were to announce further restrictions in a particular area, that would not mean that schools had to close or not open. It would possibly mean that those things were essential to stop schools having to close or prevent them from opening in the first place. So don't always see it in, in one direction. It may be actually more in the other. John. Thanks, First Minister. I think the most important point about the position that we find ourselves in now in relation to the, uh, the results is that we're at the end of uh, the third stage of a four-stage process. And the final stage of the process is appeals. And I think young people and schools who believe that results uh, that uh, are not appropriate and that they have the evidence to challenge them should come forward with, those, uh, with, with that evidence and that will be considered by the SQA. And I would stress that you know, the SQA is made up of teachers from around the country who are contributing a huge amount of their time and their energy to supporting our national examination system within Scotland. So those um, appeals will be, will be considered fairly and squarely by SQA personnel, the length and breadth of the country, and I would encourage young people to come forward on that basis if they have the evidence to support it. Um, and uh, finally today, Henry Hepburn from the Times Educational Supplement. Hi, is there any prospect as in England of Scottish people being able to sit an exam in the coming months to achieve high results? Sorry, Henry, we're not hearing you. You're not very clear. Sorry, uh, try again. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah, it's a bit better, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I'm just, I was asking, is there any prospect, as is the case in England, of Scottish pupils being able to sit an exam in the coming months to achieve a better result? That's not in our plans. We're planning for the exam diet in 2021, in the spring of 2021. And what we uh, put into the system was uh, the appeal mechanism, which is uh, a free to access appeal system based on evidence to enable young people to be able to challenge any of the, um, the, the results that they have received that they don't think are appropriate. So we, we built the appeals process in to enable young people to have an opportunity to challenge any results, and I would encourage them to do so if they feel that they, they, they wish to take that course of action. Okay, thanks very much. And uh, that concludes our questions today. If you've uh, stuck with us throughout, thank you uh, for being with us. There's obviously really important issues uh, today to get through, so that's uh, why we've taken a little bit longer um, than normal. Um, can I thank John uh, and Gregor uh, today and, and thank Anna as well, uh, who has been our BSL interpreter, and thank you. Can I just end uh, where I started, really, by uh, paying tribute to young people across the country. If you've got the results that you were hoping for today, you can absolutely hold your head up high and be confident that those results are as valid this year as they would have been last year, notwithstanding the difficult and unique circumstances uh, that we have been living through. That's uh, why the system uh, that we've been talking a lot about today has had to be put in place. If you are a young person that is disappointed in your results, um, you have that option of appealing, and it's really important that you speak to uh, your teacher or uh, 
the uh, helpline that I, I read it earlier on, and you'll find that on the, the Twitter feed later, to get advice on making that appeal. And remember, there's other options for you, and Skills Development Scotland is there to talk through uh, those options as well. But to all of you, you have uh, gone through this this year in the most difficult of circumstances. And uh, John and I just want to reiterate our well done and thanks uh, to all of you for, for your patience um, and forbearance in all of this. Um, finally, can I just end by asking people again to remember that this virus is still out there. We're dealing with a, a very challenging situation in Aberdeen and I uh, and Gregor in particular uh, will spend uh, no doubt much of the afternoon uh, discussing some of the issues there and considering whether there are decisions we have to take over and above what's been done right now uh, to try to contain that situation. And I'm afraid that's going to be the way of things uh, for the foreseeable future uh, with outbreaks that we have to try and get on top of. But as I said yesterday, we can all help with this each and every single one of us, if we follow all of the advice, uh, which is where I will leave you again today with the facts advice. Face coverings, avoid crowded places, clean your hands and hard surfaces, two metres distancing, and self-isolate and book a test if you have symptoms of COVID. And if we all do all of these things, uh, then we help those on the front line make sure uh, that these outbreaks don't arise, um, and when they do, they are easy to get easier to get under control. So my thanks to everybody uh, who continues to follow that advice. If you haven't been doing so, uh, can I appeal to you to maybe tighten up in future? Um, I'll be back tomorrow at 12.15 uh, for the daily briefing. And in the meantime, thanks very much for joining us.